Okay, let's kick it off. So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's Green Business Webinar. Uh, my name is Louise Howard and I'm the Head of Brand and Communications here at Zender and I'm happy to present Graham Major X, our Head of Green Business. So today we're going to be hearing specifically about what immediate impact shippers can achieve with green logistics solutions. The presentation is going to shed light on best practices that organizations can implement to move towards becoming a low carbon operation. And then we're going to take some time at the end for a Q&A session. So just before we get started, I'd like to cover a couple of quick housekeeping uh, items. So as questions come to you for Graham, you can enter them into your Q&A box throughout the webinar, and then we will answer as many of them as possible following the presentation. And just a reminder that we will be sending a link to the recording as a follow-up for the webinar. So if you would like to view it on demand or share it with your peers. Okay, let's get started. Uh, hi, Graham. Hi, Louise. Hi, so um, maybe we can just kick off by setting the scene and getting a bit of background from you. Uh, so can we uh, get a bit of an introduction from yourself and explain firstly what Green Business is um, and how did you get into it? Sure. Well, thanks very much. Uh, very happy to be here today and nice to see all of you here uh, joining for this webinar. Um, I'm Graham Major X, as, as Louise mentioned, and I'm originally from New York City, but I've been in Europe for about uh, four years now, and I've been the head of green business at Sender for about two and a half, and I've always been in the business world uh, coming from New York, but my father's also a climate scientist, uh, so that sort of put me on the track towards getting towards uh, renewable energy and towards green business. And to answer your other question, the way we define green business at Sender, which I think is a good way to kick us off for this webinar, is providing business solutions that are low carbon in nature. And, you know, there are a lot of companies out there, probably many of you among our guests today um, have real carbon targets. And so we uh, seek to allow our customers to fulfill those carbon targets with our green business offerings. So let's kick off with a couple of um, a couple of thought starters, let's say. And I'm going to start by saying that the world is changing fast. Now, um, we don't have microphones on here, but I would just ask everybody if you can just imagine your answers to these questions actively. Um, I think it'll be a lot more fun for you to participate. Um, and then certainly it'll, it'll kick us off well for the question and answer at the end. So the world is changing fast. You might know that this is the best-selling phone in 2007, and the best-selling phone on the right is the iPhone. Um, you may ask yourself, okay, when did the iPhone first launch? And it is actually the year 2007, so 15 years ago, and that was the best-selling uh, phone in the world. So how long did it take for the iPhone to become number one in the world? Maybe imagine an answer. Some people say one month, some people say five years. Well, the answer is one and a half years. And the point of that is that technology adaptation is exponential. It doesn't go one, two, three, four, five. It goes 0 0.1, 1%, 10%, 100%. And that's why we don't see any flip phones in the market today. We are in a period very similar to 2007 as the iPhone launched when we're looking at decarbonization uh, on the enterprise level and also in the logistics sector. And that's why I'm really excited to be uh, here today for this webinar. Now, here's another one. What does an autonomous truck look like? Well, Usually when I talk to folks about autonomous vehicles, they picture a truck with a seat and a steering wheel, but nobody driving it. But here's a rendering from an OEM about what an autonomous truck will look like. And it's very interesting to think as we change the nature of our technology, it changes the nature of what it does. And you can see there's no human driver for this one. Um, so it ends up being built in a very different way. All right. This is planet Earth, as I'm sure we're all aware. And if you can imagine yourself sitting in a car, driving straight up into the sky at highway speeds, how long would it take for you to get to the end of the breathable atmosphere? All right, if you're driving straight up into the sky. When I ask this question for our new joiners at Sender, they often say a week, a month, 10 days, I don't know. It usually answers along those lines, but the real answer is six minutes. And the point of that is that the atmosphere is actually a very small place. And even though when we look up at the sky, it feels infinite, it's a very small place. And that is what's actually enabling climate change to take place because we are putting a lot of uh, carbon into the atmosphere. And because it's such a small place, we're able to change the composition of the atmosphere, which leads to this. 
global temperature increase. And I'm not saying anything that anyone doesn't know, but I just want to set the baseline for how we get to solutions and what they are. So far in the last hundred years, global temperature change has been on average about 1.2 degrees Celsius over the baseline before uh, our current fossil fuel age. Here we have the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere for the past 800,000 years. And you can see that it's never once been above this line of 300 parts per million. And in the last uh, several years, about 50 years, it's shot absolutely um, exponentially upwards above 400 parts per million. And that's the problem. So if we even say, what does that even mean? Well, if we were to take a very big explosion and say how many of these would need to go off every day to equal this 1.2 degrees of change that we just looked at, it would be 400,000 of these going off every day. That's the amount of heat that's now trapped in the atmosphere, leading to things like this, which was close to my wife's uh, family home in uh, Aachen in Germany about a year ago. So that's the situation we all find ourselves in. But fortunately, there are ways out of this. And so what we need to ask ourselves is how do we get to a stable climate? And when we're looking at a stable climate, we look at these things called pathways. And we have a 1.5 degree pathway and a two degree pathway. These are both stable, safe, uh, places that we want to get to by the end of the decade, uh, by the end of the century. And you can see that in the current decade for both of these pathways, we have a very uh, sharp downward emissions curve. And that's why our action today is so important because we're setting the, basically the pace of carbon reduction for the rest of the century, which then determines which pathway we're going to be on. How big is road freight actually, when we look at the overall climate? Well, if you look at everything that's on the road, both passenger cars and road freight, it makes up 11.9% of global emissions. All airplanes in the world make up 1.9%. All boats in the world make 1.7%. And all trains in the world make 0.4% of total emissions. Road freight alone is about 5% of total global emissions. So outside of passenger cars, it's about 5%. That means that road freight alone is more than all the airplanes, all the boats, and all the rail in the world combined. Um, and that means we have a big size of prize here if we want to make a dent in our global emissions. Fortunately, there's a couple drivers of change. And the way we see this is that there are strategic global shifts, which include corporate strategy, which I'll show you just some numbers in a minute and government policy. I'm sure we all see this in the news every day. You probably saw that the big climate bill in the United States was passed uh, two days ago. So that's really, really good news. Um, we have similar things with the EU Green Deal happening in Europe. And then we have industry check tech changes, and these apply to many industries, but especially in the logistics industries, we can see them uh, particularly strongly. Uh, changes in fuel types, automation, and digitization are all levers that are going to uh, exponentially transform uh, our businesses when they come to carbon intensity. Here are the Fortune 50 companies, mentions of climate change in their reporting to the Securities and Exchange Commission in their financial reports, annual financial reports. Now this is particularly informative because companies only report things in their financial reports to the SEC if it has a material or potentially material impact on their business. So this is essentially saying to the government regulators and to investors, climate change, including seven or eight terms that were uh, part of this study, um, may have a material impact on our business. And you can see from 2011 to 2018, slight increases year over year, but in the following two years to 2019 and 2020, massively shot up. And I haven't seen the numbers for 2021 yet, but I imagine that they will be continuing this trajectory. And this represents the corporate strategy change as we see here. These are just some examples, but you can go to sciencebasedtargets.org and check out uh, all of the companies who have set science-based targets. There's many more who have set other targets. And uh, these are very aggressive targets. You know, you see numbers like 25% reduction in overall emissions from AB InBev by 2025. I might just uh, remind everybody that 2025 might sound like it's very far in the future, but it's about two and a half years in the future. So if you were going to have a kid uh, next week, that kid would be two and a half years old when this uh, would need to be fulfilled 25% reduction. That is a big chunk of emissions reduction. And you can, of course, visit science-based target initiatives for learning more there. 
So that was sort of the intro just to get our, our minds warmed up and have, have a little bit of fun uh, thinking about exponential change. But uh, let's switch over to managing emissions. How can we do that as companies when we are saying, hey, maybe we do want to do this or maybe we already do this, but we want to look more specifically at logistics. How can we do that? Here are three frameworks that I would just highlight as sort of key frameworks for understanding emissions and how to calculate them and how to set targets. So the first one is the GHG protocol, which stands for Greenhouse Gas Protocol. And this is a company emissions accounting framework. This is, if you've ever heard the words scope one, scope two, and scope three, that is where this comes from. It comes from the GHG protocol. And it basically decides who owns the carbon emissions in the entire supply chain. This is really the standard for company emissions reporting and accounting. And it's probably the first step that you wanna uh, make sure that your company is following if you are putting together a greenhouse gas emissions report uh, or accounting for your company. Second is from the Smart Freight Center, something called the GLEC framework. And the GLEC framework, I kind of think of as like the United Nations of carbon emissions calculations in the logistics sector. They define standards for emissions calculating for every single type of transport, road, rail, uh, air, uh, sea, et cetera. Um, so they, with a lot of detail, this is really the, the way to build up, uh, ground up the calculations for uh, emissions in logistics, the GLEC framework. And then the third, which a lot of our customers talk about and have implemented themselves, <clears throat> it's called science-based targets. And that's from the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And that is a framework which companies can set their own targets for reduction to generally be in line with their own industry and with the targets of achieving those pathways that we talked about up above, the stable pathways for the climate of 1.5 to 2 degrees uh, overall increase in uh, temperature globally. Um, this is one way to set that. And then I also just throw some other ones up here that might be of interest for people that are interested in looking further. Um, these are, this is not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of really great climate organizations, but some that might be of interest are the Climate Pledge, uh, essentially the Paris Agreement 10 years early from a corporate perspective. World Economic Forum is doing a lot of great things. ALICE for everyone in Europe is the uh, Logistics Alliance for uh, Low Carbon Logistics. Um, and then there's the EV100 and RE100, which are essentially com uh, company commitments to using 100% electric vehicles and 100% renewable energy. There is a right way and a wrong way to do this. And I highlight two areas that are of importance to our business at Sender and for a lot of our customers. So when we talk about transport emissions, we want to talk about well to wheel emissions. That's the correct way to understand emissions. And that's accounting for the use of the uh, fuel in a vehicle, the emissions that comes from there, but also the production of that fuel and the emissions that come from that. It's very important to take the entire supply chain, get into the exhaust that comes out of the back or in terms of electric, you wanna take into account what type of electricity is going into that truck um, to understand what the total emissions are. It would be incorrect to just do tank to wheel which means uh, just essentially counting, accounting for what comes out of the back of the truck, but not looking at the fuel production emissions earlier in the uh, life cycle. So that's where transport emissions, very, very important. And then secondly, company-wide emissions, super important to look at greenhouse gases, which are measured in CO2 equivalent, or that's usually written CO2E. That accounts for all greenhouse gases, which includes methane, um, I believe it's called nitrous oxide, but N2O, and the F gases, which are sort of like coolants. Um, the, uh, so it is possible to just measure CO2, carbon dioxide, but that would leave out all of these other gases, which account for 26% of global emissions. So just to highlight again, the correct ways are well to wheel when we're talking about transport, accounting for the entire emission cycle of the fuels in use, and on the company-wide level, accounting for all greenhouse gases as laid out by the Kyoto Protocol, um, and that's measured in CO2 equivalent. Now, when we look at, okay, great, that sounds good, Graham. So we're gonna roll out the, we're gonna roll out the GLEC framework after we have our uh, GHG protocol in place and we're doing our annual carbon report. 
but don't we have to get things perfect right at the very beginning? And I would say, you know what, the best thing you can do is just get the ball rolling. And when it comes to transport emissions, the best way to do that is to start with the standard values. So that's modeled emissions using standard values, which are essentially industry standards. That means on average, diesel will give you this much emissions. On average, electric will give you this much emissions, something like that. Um, also fuel consumption. Just taking industry averages. That's a very good start because it gives it gives you a lot of visibility into probably what's happening with a little bit of uh, conservatism built into those values. Now, the second step would be to model those same equations for uh, emissions, but actually take fleet values or values from the uh, providers that are driving your trucks, driving your trains, etc. That's, that allows you to take a sample and say, okay, we think we can improve on the standardized values, which are sort of average of average. We can take an average of our fleet or an average of our providers and get slightly more accurate values to hone that in. And then the third step is actual emissions value with telematics data. And I can tell you that I'm super happy that at Sender, we have moved almost entirely to this second group and we're looking at the third group already. So we're really happy to have built, started with number one, moved to number two, and now we're looking at number three as well. It is a process and I can say we've learned a lot over time, um, but it's very, very helpful to say, you know what, uh, we're gonna not, not try to start with the perfect solution, but we roll this out with a strategy to continuously improve over time. Okay. So now let's look at decarbonizing um, our companies and our logistics. When we look at the global climate situation, which we just looked at a little bit on the front slides, we can look at what's the, what's the carbon reduction plan for, for the globe. And this is essentially directly from uh, our friend Bill Gates, who wrote a, a pretty excellent book on climate recently called How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. I definitely recommend it to anybody who's interested in picking up a book on climate change. And he says, look, there's three steps. First, we just have to electrify everything that we possibly can. Second, we have to build as much carbon-free electricity as possible. That means solar, wind, hydro. There's not that much that hasn't been built, um, et cetera. And then three is replace non-electrifiable technology with the low carbon version of it. Um, there are some things that it's not possible to decarbonize, like cement production, for example, but there might be low carbon cement that can replace the high carbon cement processes that are in place. So that's kind of an example of what he's talking about there. So that's the overall global strategy. And if we say, okay, how do we, how do we then take that into our logistics? Well, at Sender, we say, okay, we're gonna focus on advanced fuels, replacing, allowing our customers by choice to replace fossil fuels with advanced fuels that can reduce emissions by up to 90%, and then measuring and reporting those emissions automatically. We have a system that, that, has, um, that basically automatically calculates the emissions from every single transport that is based on the GLEC framework. So that's how we've approached it. And then let's look at what we can put into our trucks that's replacing those fossil fuels. So you can see on the left-hand side are all of the fuels that reduce emissions by more than 50% compared to fossil diesel. I would highlight a few for you here. <clears throat> One of them includes B100, which is also known as biodiesel. It's also known as FAME for its sort of chemical, uh, a shorthand for its chemical composition, but that's usually known as biodiesel or B100. Um, the fuel that we use gets about a 60% reduction in emissions compared to fossil diesel. Bio LNG and bio CNG are renewable versions of LNG and CNG, which are fossil fuels. Those stand for liquefied natural gas and compressed natural gas. Those are both fossil fuels. And then on the left-hand side, we have bio-liquefied natural gas and bio-compressed natural gas. Those are renewable versions that are usually made from uh, food waste uh, from biogas plants. Those reduce emissions by about 65 to 70%. You've got electric. This is a, let's call it a good guesstimate average for Western Europe um, in 2022, a 75% reduction in emissions. Depends very much on where your electricity comes from because we're measuring well to wheel and then HVO. And HVO is the second generation of biodiesel that gets up to basically up to 93% reduction in emissions. Here we're showing 90% reduction. Um, and 90% is really what we are able to achieve today already. 
these fuels on the left are the ones that are the fastest uh, ways to take a big chunk out of carbon emissions. And what we what we operate today at Sender are HVO, electric, and B100 biodiesel. This is where those are available just from us. And there may be some points on the map, um, like for example, Switzerland is highlighted, nothing here, but there are some even hydrogen trucks available in Switzerland. I'm happy to have an extended conversation about hydrogen if anyone's interested uh, as well afterwards. Um, you can see that there is a lot of dark green that represents the HVO availability that we have in our network. And that's getting a 90% reduction in emissions. Um, there's about 500 fuel stations in the Nordic countries that offer HVO. There's about 15 in the Baltics. Uh, Germany, not such good coverage, but not bad. Denmark, uh, Netherlands, and Belgium have about 150 to 200 fuel stations combined for HVO. And then in France, uh, we're concentrating on the B100 at the moment uh, because it's a very strong market for that, getting the 60% reduction in emissions. And for anyone operating um, in Austria, you may know that it's quite a good market also for biodiesel. So there's really a lot of availability in the entire market for road freight for these green fuels that are already able to plug into existing trucks. We don't need to buy new trucks. We don't need to build new charging infrastructure. We can just use these renewable diesel and biodiesel, uh, mostly with existing trucks, to uh, make that decarbonization a reality. So. When we say, okay, now let's look at what should we what should we be doing in terms of our strategy? What should we be doing in terms of uh, technology adoption? Well, when we look at speed of scaling and we look at how, let's say, easy or hard is it to roll out, we say, okay, HVO and B100, those are the ones that are today. They're super scalable. They're ready to go. We don't need to build a lot of new things. We just need to know where those fuels are and make sure that our trucks get to them on behalf of our customers. Electric is really happening right now. It, it may feel like it's a small percentage and it is a small percentage of overall uh, transports, but we are, remember we're on an exponential curve. So it doesn't go one, two, three, four, five. It goes 0 0.1, 1%, 10%, 100%. That's exactly the curve that we're on for electric. And it just we just happen to be right at the beginning. So it looks very small. But this is the year that electric is going to begin in earnest for heavy duty transports. We already began our first electric transports last year with heavy duty vehicles. Um, and uh, we also believe that it's a area worth um, concentrating on now to make sure that we have the capabilities for the future. I can imagine that a lot of our customers um, feel the same way. And then lastly, these gas technologies, every company is gonna decide differently how they wanna handle these. At Sender, we don't offer these as a service. We happen to be running uh, some, some bio LNG, let's say um, in certain circumstances, um, but we don't offer this as a service because we know, you know we wanna focus on the 90% reduction from HVO, um, the scalability with uh, B100 biodiesel and the future, which is electric. So this sort of middle technology for us is not where we're concentrating our energies, but of course, every company needs to decide based on their circumstances and their capabilities, um, what's, what's, uh, what's best for them. Now, if we look over to electric, because this is what we just said, okay, this is the year that it begins in earnest. If we were to take the electricity mix from Europe, country by country, and then we plug in what we think is going to be probably the um, immediate term electricity usage, which is about 1.4 kilowatt hours per kilometer, maybe 1.5. Um, but I've seen tests that go all the way down to 1.1. So we have to see where that lands uh, as we get more and more vehicles on the road. But let's say 1.4 for now should be a good measure for 2022, 2023. We can see that in countries like France, we have a 92% reduction in emissions. Um, they have a very, very low uh, elect, uh, car low carbon electricity grid, Austria also. Um, and then we go all the way down to, let's say 42%, 49% uh, savings in Germany. That's already great because the thing about electric is that as we add more and more renewables to our grid, following our Bill Gates one, two, three step, as we add more and more renewables to our grid, all the electric vehicles that are on the grid charging get greener every year. So this is just saying what's happening now, but in two or three years from now, all those vehicles actually get greener over time. So electric is a very, very good investment for getting things green. 
No, I also put Poland here because we have an office in Poland, uh, one of um, one of our several offices. And you can see that today it's actually increasing emissions by 10% to run with electricity. But I call that out to say that that's only true if we're running uh, that on the grid electricity. But if we were, for an example, to have a solar installation at a warehouse and we were to charge those trucks on the solar directly from the warehouse, we would actually be at 100% emission savings um, when we look at the, the well to wheel. So. Um, it, there are uh, there are solutions for nearly every single country, um, and of course, as we build up the capabilities, that's going to become easier and easier to do. And here's an example of our electric truck, and you may notice that it is at a fuel station, but it's not fueling anything; it's actually charging. And um, this is a pretty special picture because this was one of the first transports we ever did electric, and. Um, you may also notice that we're actually taking up two parking spots. And that's because this is not optimized for trucks yet. So we're able to do this already today and there are definitely solutions, um, but I think we're gonna see the ease of running electric trucks get much, much better over the next couple of years because we're not gonna have to take up two parking spots, uh, making a Tesla owner <laughs> honk their horn maybe at us if we're taking too much time. That's not a real story, by the way. Um, but uh, just to say that this is going to get easier over time as the infrastructure gets built out for trucks. So this is the example um, with our friends and customers over at Cabot. We were able to set this up and we're actually doing a 300 kilometer plus round trip um, with this electric truck. And that's the one you just saw. We're charging 100% on the highway, which is very exciting. And it's also an international cross-border trip. Um, we also are using the full payload of the truck. So there are really no punches pulled with this electric performance. Um, we are running, you know, essentially normal lanes. And this is just to say we're at the 0.1% of this uh, growth phase. And this is, this is how all of these things begin. We learned a lot. It took about, I would say, six months or so to, from conception to first truck. And uh, now we are running this on a weekly basis for our customers. So let's talk about maybe a couple ideas to take home. And the first I would say is that um, this is open for debate, let's say, but I really personally strongly believe this is that exponential uh, factors with regards to both technology and climate change are going to choose winners and losers in business. It's no longer a nice to have. It's a um, game changer for many companies. And just to take electric as an example in our industry, but I believe there's probably a dozen examples of nearly exactly the same thing. If you look at the battery density per kilogram, it grows 11% per year. That means the battery can hold twice as much as it did six years ago. And in six years, it's gonna hold twice as much as it does now. The same thing is happening for battery prices. The battery price is dropping 15% per year. So that means in five years, it's going to cost half as much to have a battery that holds twice as much. That is a game-changing uh, phenomena when you know that the cost of an electric truck is 80% batteries at the moment. That is going to massively drive down the price and increase the effectiveness of electric vehicles. You can also see that there's going to be other improvements, which are a second uh, uh, exponential curve, which is the global electric vehicle production is increasing exponentially. It's got about a 50% compound annual growth rate. It's very difficult to find anything that has a 50% compound annual growth rate. That's happening in electric vehicles right now. That means they're going to be produced more efficiently. They're going to have higher quality um, and companies are learning to produce them more effectively. That's going to have an, a second exponential growth curve there. And the third is charging stations. Um, they are growing at 35% uh, annual growth rate. So we're seeing a lot of uh, converging curves here. And this doesn't even take into account the falling, exponentially falling cost of uh, renewable energy from solar and wind. Also, when you use batteries to take uh, grid and balance uh, grid produced energy. So really, um, the exponential curves are the ones to keep an eye on, even though they seem very small at the moment. And then the last thoughts to take home are, um, one of my favorite phrases from uh, NASA, who uh, have done a few things like, like put humans on the moon, they say, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And I really personally believe that it's much better to proactively decarbonize today than suffer paralysis through analysis. 
you know, uh, I can tell you in our journey here at Sender, we've learned so much by just doing, getting the trucks on the road. Now we understand how to route trucks effectively to different fuel stations and what kind of processes we need to build out. What kind of software backing did we need to do that? What kind of internal capabilities do we need to have? We learned all that by getting started and getting trucks on the road. And now we're quite effective at it. Um, paralysis through analysis uh, is something to be avoided. Second is uh, understand the mission sources and the potential decarbonization levers. We talked about a couple of them, but if we just go back to Bill Gates to keep it simple, get it electric, build renewables, and optimize things that are uh, high carbon with low carbon alternatives. Of course, HVO, perfect example of that. We've got 16 million trucks on the road in Europe. Most of them are diesel. We can put HVO into those trucks now as we're building up the fleet of electric trucks. That is a great way to decarbonize today as we still build up the capabilities for tomorrow. And then thirdly, uh, realizing that implementing green business is not a cost center, it's a strategic advantage. Think about the things that you get if you really say we're gonna prioritize this. You're gonna have greater efficiency in your operations. That means lower costs, not higher costs. You're gonna build out technology that allows you to do things like routing, for example, to different fuel stations or uh, receipt processing or financial uh, setups that you didn't have before because you need to have the tech to process these new, more difficult things. That's great because then you're gonna have that as a strategic tech capability that otherwise wouldn't have been there. And then the third is a broader range of access to customers and investors. Um, I see that all the time in the news that one fund after another says, you know, we're only gonna invest in companies that have a strong green impact. It's no longer an exclusion list, but actually a proactive uh, green list that a lot of investors are looking for. And that's also true in, you know, you see the, the tendency for new um, green funds launching onto the market, ETFs and things like that. So um, more access to customers and more access to investors. So those are some ideas to take home. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, our questions and our discussion. I'm very happy to uh, join you all here today. And thanks for letting me share some thoughts here. And uh, we'll open it up for discussion. And uh, maybe I hand it over to Louise, who I think is having an eye on all of your questions in the question and answer. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Graham. Really interesting. And we have got some uh, great questions lined up for you. Um, so I'm going to kick right off just in the interest of time. So first question that's come in. Um, so just uh, regarding the bio, uh, the biofuel, so biodiesel, have you counted the fact that no, um, that to produce biodiesel, you need to consume more energy uh, than you can produce out of biodiesel? So effectively, it's not green, but more polluting than fossil. Now, I know that's something that comes up quite a lot in discussions. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, I think we need to look at what the source of the energy is. And I think it's clear that biodiesel, when done correctly, reduces overall emissions. Uh, because the main source of, uh, of energy for biodiesel is the sun. And that's because it is helping us grow plants, which then get turned into oil, which then get turned into biodiesel. So that's one process there, which allows us to reduce overall emissions when you consider the entire chain of events. The other is, for example, HVO in Europe is produced from food waste. So you can imagine McDonald's French fry oil gets sent over to our friends at Nesta who produce HVO, and then that is turned into a renewable diesel. So basically, uh, when we use waste products to produce these fuels, that is a really, really low carbon way to do it. The other way to do it when, for example, this gentleman is talking about um, uh, biodiesel. Um, growing from plants, the plants get their energy primarily from the sun. And of course, there are emissions that come from producing that. But at the end of the day, we have to consider that fossil fuels are not the solution, and we should not let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, good for now is massive carbon redu reduction using existing vehicles and existing technology. We're super happy to offer that to our customers. Um, and we get the sort of perfect solutions going on as we continue to grow our business. Brilliant, thank you, Graham. Um, another question that I think we did actually cover in, uh, in the slides after was just uh, regarding the uh, electric truck uh, example that we had. 
um, and what it pay it what its payload was. Um, so that if it wasn't a full payload, then it would actually be changing the maths. But I think you covered that that we did actually do uh, a full uh, full payload there, um, okay. which full was payload. great. Exactly. Yeah. Um, another one. Uh, so, what's the biggest challenge of implementing the wheel-to-wheel -wheel measurement approach? Uh, and also the focus on the CO2 e calculations as opposed to just CO2? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, basically, whoever is going to be responsible for that at the organization is to set out knowing that that's the case. That's basically the number one thing. To, the fact that you know that already, you've done 75% of what you need to do. And then the, the second thing is make sure that the numbers you're getting are actually accounting for all of those. And it's just a super simple question. You know, Is this greenhouse gas emissions or is this CO2? And um, for example, when you look at the technology of liquefied natural gas in trucks, and I just take this example because I'm relatively familiar with the transport industry, um, LNG can have methane leaks from the, from the truck. You know, uh, if it gets too hot or um, there's a, a sort of leaky, leaky valves or whatever, um, it can it can actually come out the back of the truck through the through the exhaust pipe. So you can have methane leaks that are basically not accounted for if you're excluding methane from from the calculations, if you only look at CO2. But if you say, hey, we want to look at all greenhouse gas emissions, um, then you're going to include those methane leaks. And that has an impact on the overall CO2, uh, the overall greenhouse gas calculation. So. Um, the, the most important thing is just keeping it in mind. I wouldn't say there's been major challenges because all of the numbers you need to do those calculations exist out there. Some of the standards we talked about, um, GHG protocol requires that, um, the GLEC framework also requires that. So as soon as you're working with these standards and you have the right people uh, paying attention to it, it shouldn't be too big of an issue. Thanks for the question. Okay, now um, back to um, electric vehicles. So what proportion of the loads uh, Zender is using EVs for are Zender trucks versus other owners? Yeah, so maybe that's a one step, we'll take one step back about our business model. You know, Zender is a, a digital freight forwarder. And so we have a strong focus on technology and we have a, um, a base of carriers who operate all of our transports. We are an asset light company. So we actually don't own any trucks. We don't own any warehouses. We don't own any trailers, um, but we do have uh, a big base of carriers who we work closely with. And we also have a set of chartered fleets uh, that work hundred percent for sender. So in this constellation, um, the EVs fit into this picture um, that they are the property, of course, of one of our carriers. But we work especially closely with our carriers when it comes to electric vehicles, uh, just because it requires a lot more uh, attention and handholding on all sides of the equation uh, than other transports might. Brilliant. Um, another interesting one, I think everyone is very aware of uh, the current soaring prices um, of fuel. And we've got a question saying, are, the, are there economical advantages of using biofuel in light of soaring fossil diesel costs? That is a great question. And I would say that it depends. I'm sorry to give that answer, but it really does depend. It's very situation specific. For example, if you go to Austria, the cost of biodiesel at the pump will be lower than the cost of fossil diesel. The reason being that they have a different tax structure for biodiesel. So right now, I would say there can be circumstances where there are economic advantages for using biofuel. It's also a different supply chain. So that means there's the possibility of decoupling from fossil diesel um, in terms of the production cost from fossil diesel to renewable fuels. However, that being said, the way it's priced at the pump right now and most uh, fuel distributors is not creating any economic advantages. Furthermore, uh, when we look at the uh, EU rules that are going to be rolled out over the next couple of years, um, one of them is going to be a tax similar to the German uh, carbon tax that's going to be rolled out on an EU wide level. I believe it starts in 2026 with the emissions trading system for road freight. There will be a different tax level for fossil fuels versus biofuels versus zero emissions vehicles like battery electric. So um, this is exactly why building up the expertise now is a very strong strategic advantage for 2025, 2026, when those rules really do hit the road, um, because the companies that are already running it may even get a financial advantage on top of the carbon advantage. 
Lovely, thank you. Um, now we've got a couple of questions just to clarify. Um, again, around the, I think electric vehicles has uh, has spiked some interest. Um, so just wanted to, to clarify um, if it's been understood correctly that the key point will be electricity production. So being able to produce green electricity or else it's going to be like in Poland and potentially be counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's why we go back to Bill Gates and, you know, electrify, renewable and decarbonize. The, we need to do all three. And if we just electrify and we don't build renewables, then we're not doing ourselves any favors. But if we want to stay on that 1.5 degree pathway or the two degree pathway to get that stable climate, we really need to build a massive amount of renewables. And that's why when you look at the strategies from all of the biggest economies in the world, when they talk about their decarbonization plans, one of the cornerstones, the absolute cornerstones is uh, renewable energy production, India, China, US, EU, all four of them are essentially saying the way to do this is with solar, solar and wind, solar wind batteries, something like that. Brilliant, makes sense. Um, and we also got a couple of questions wanting maybe a little bit more detail and clarification around that uh, EV um, that, uh, that actually took place and that was the example you used. So just um, maybe detailing out a little bit of the, the 40 tons, we've got a couple of questions in asking if that includes the, the batteries or if you know, it's not included or is included in that, uh, that 40 ton truck um, yeah. and sort of what's the maximum cargo it can take. So the maximum cargo that vehicle can take is actually 50 tons. So above the 40 ton standard, uh, that would be for diesel trucks. So um, that truck is also used to haul bricks for the city of Rotterdam, and uh, that's a very heavy payload. So um, there was no uh, upward payload limit on that truck at all. Um, there are uh, payload limits when we're talking about crossing borders or, or sort of other regulations. But in terms of the actual vehicle, there was no um, no upward payload limit. And for our customer, there was also no payload limit that impacted the ability for us to do the shipments with the full payload. So I would need to check on that specific vehicle, the amount of uh, battery weight. But um, I have done this calculation for a number of vehicles, and it usually comes out to about two tons of additional weight in terms of batteries. And there is an EU directive that states that um, OEM, so truck producers, can qualify their heavy duty vehicles to get an extra two tons of allowed capacity so that you're essentially balancing out the, the weight of the batteries uh, in an additional allowed two tons of payload. So um, there's been sort of a lot of made about that, I think five or six years ago that, I don't know, batteries are going to weigh 35 tons or something like that. Um, but that's the, that's the advantage of the exponential downward curve where batteries get denser, they get cheaper, they get more effective. So um, in that vehicle, it was not a problem at all. And we don't foresee that being a problem at all uh, with electric heavy duty vehicles. Brilliant, thank you for clarifying. Um, so cool. Okay, I think we've got time for one last question. Um, just very aware of how precious time is. Um, there's a question just around, um, again, the, the biofuels, uh, biodiesel, um, and uh, just un trying to get a bit more information around the biomethane and the circular economy. I know you mentioned it uh, at the very beginning. So the, the question says that, you know, circular economy could uh, basically source uh, regionally uh, biogas um, from water treatments, waste material, et cetera. Um, mm. and so interested to hear your side of, uh, of that. Yeah, well, I think it's a fantastic question. And I would just highlight primarily that actually HVO uh, is sourced from waste materials. So that's the, that's the first thing I would highlight is that we are actually doing that uh, every single day um, with our use of HVO. So we're using food waste products uh, to which are turned into renewable diesel called HVO. And that is a renewable diesel that can go into any diesel truck. So that is the perfect end of the circle economy uh, where we can then, let's say, deliver food with a truck that's run on food waste. So that that's really very good news. Um, the thing about uh, electric vehicles is that we have to remember that the only way to really get to zero carbon is by running renewable energy and electrifying. And that's why we can get to zero emissions. Of course, there are questions about um, you know, where, it, where are battery materials coming from? Um, but the main thing we should remember is let's not let perfect be the enemy of great. 
you know, we're not looking for the perfect solution. We're looking for the set of solutions, which is a lot of them, that will keep us on a 1.5 degree pathway. I haven't seen any numbers that suggest that we can achieve a 1.5 degree pathway by using one single solution. And if someone were to say, Graham, I think we can do it with one single solution, I would say, I want to see those numbers because I have, I've yet to see anything even close to that. When you look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they basically say, we need to electrify everything. We need to build a lot of renewables. We need to do all of that circular economy things like renewable fuels, HBO, biomethane, et cetera. We need to do all of that sustainable aviation fuel. And we need to increase efficiency. And we still need to take carbon out of the, out of the atmosphere by planting trees and perhaps carbon removal. So we basically need to do everything. And I uh, just want to please be on record saying we need to do everything. We're here proposing the solutions that we find are the best, the most scalable, and also the ones that are future-proof uh, for our industry to allow us to provide good solutions to our customers with low carbon emissions. So we're here to do, we're here to do the ones that are most effective. Lovely. And I think that's a, an extensive conversation, lots of variables that go into it. I know that we don't have time uh, to, to continue this online, so we will be um, answering any other questions that didn't get a chance to get covered. And I know that, Graham, you and your team are available to, to be following up and having maybe more in-depth conversations with individuals uh, about any questions or queries that have come up. Um, yeah. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for your time today. As I said, we will be sending uh, this recording out along with um, a short recap after uh, the session. So thank you ever so much and um, have a lovely day.